Library. Happy to welcome you all here this evening. I do want to let you know we did leave a little survey on your chairs, and I have some student volunteers that are going to be around. So if you didn't have a chance to fill those out, we'd love for you to do that. And I'm hoping. So there's Trent, he'll grab them for you. If you haven't turned it in, he'll come and get that. He'll collect your little pencils too. Or if you need a pencil, he has one for you. We like to always get some input from our audience as far as future programs. So uh, while he's doing that, I want to mention a few programs that we have happening this month. And the first one, we partner with the McMurray Rotary. And on the second and fourth Fridays of every month, we are doing a, what we call an afternoon tunes. And this is an opportunity to just sing some of the old songs that you've enjoyed uh, from the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, even before that into the 50s and 40s. So it's, it's been a wonderful event we have. It's very casual. It's upstairs in our reading room. Also coming up this month on Thursday, February the 20th, we are doing our very first uh, like murder mystery here. It's called A Well-Read Mystery. And uh, one of our um, youth librarians has organized a script. We have library staff all involved in it. We'd love for you to come. There are two time slots, 6 to 6.30 or 6.30 to 7. And you'll just mill around the library. You'll interact with us and try to gather clues as to the answer of, of who done it. Then Monday, February 24th, we are addressing uh, mental illness and the importance of QPR, which stands for Question, Persuade, and Refer. We are partnering with the state of Pennsylvania. Uh, they have a particular program that, that visits throughout the state, and it's from Prevent Suicide PA. So that's coming up on Monday, February 24th. And then the very last thing I want to bring to your attention, at the end of February, we are doing some Pasanki egg decorating with Captain Yanchev. He's one of our former police captains. He does Ukrainian Easter eggs. It'll be a two-part program. Thursday, February 27th, and then Thursday, March the 5th. So check our website. If you haven't signed up for our newsletter, you can do that at the at, on our website, or you can also do it at the front desk. So those are some of the upcoming programs, and that brings us to tonight's program. We collected our surveys, and the first person that I want to introduce tonight is uh, Gary MacArthur. He is the commander from the BFW. And for many years, since about 2006, we have partnered with the uh, BFW, and that's post-764. And we appreciate their support in bringing programs like this to our community and other programs as well. So I'd like Gary to stand. He's going to tell you a little bit more about the BFW. Real quick, I want to elaborate. Uh, our post uh, supports the military, supports the programs with the library here. Uh, and we thank all of you for coming here and supporting them. Uh, I just want to let you know that during Lent, our post is open to the public on Fridays. You can come in, have either lunch, we're open for lunch, or we're open for dinner. So I mean, take the opportunity to see what we have to offer. Uh, it's a great place. It's a non-smoking environment. We're one of the, I believe it's, uh, we're up to 60 some odd posts in the state of Pennsylvania that are now non-smoking. So, with that, thank you. And the food is really good too. We have their fish and they also, should, tell them about your chef. I, I should tell you real, real quickly. We have a, an Italian chef that cooks on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays. He's actually from Italy. Try to talk to me. I have a tough time understanding you. He's uh, it's, it's great. Patricia Makowitz, she is in charge of, she's the manager of public programs with the World Affairs Council of Pittsburgh. And I had the pleasure of meeting her last week. She's new to the position and she came out special to find the library and get to know us. So I already feel like I know you pretty well, Patty. And uh, she's going to talk a little bit more about the, uh, the, the staff that she has brought here tonight. And I uh, also want to just thank them for their partnership. Margaret Deitzer, who's the head of our reference department, has worked with them since 2006. And really, Margaret is the one who is our liaison to World Affairs and to many of our other programs that we do here at the library. So I wanted to give a thank you to Margaret for that as well. John Shine, who will be our moder 
moderator this evening. He is faculty at the Army War College in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. He teaches courses on strategy and national security policy. He has a bachelor's degree in political economics from Princeton and a master's in public policy administration from Georgetown University. He has served in a variety of command and staff positions in the Republic of Korea, Fort Bratt in North Carolina, Fort Stewart in Georgia, the Pentagon, Fort Bliss in Texas, and Fort Irwin in California. His combat deployment includes three tours in Iraq and one tour in Afghanistan. And I will turn the program over to you, Colonel Shine. Thank you, Patty, and thank you so much for having us uh, back here again to the library. Um, I did, uh, some of you, uh, I, will, I owe an apology up front because I'm not Dr. Mike Nyberg, um, who has uh, been our uh, faculty liaison here for a number of years, and he wanted me to apologize that he was unable to make it. He's uh, just returned from the continent of Africa, where he's been doing some work with some of our African. But uh, as Patty said, I'm a professor at the U.S. Army War College, which is in Carlisle, Pennsylvania, just south of Harrisburg. And I want to explain very briefly what we do there and then uh, introduce the students that we've brought out to you uh, this year. So Army War College is a professional military education uh, institution. We take serving primarily military officers who are in Usually they're, they're between about the 20th, their 20th and 24th year of service. They have performed at, at uh, the absolute peak of professionalism up to this point at what we call a tactical level of warfare and leadership. So they are experts in how to fight battles and how to lead small organizations up to roughly a thousand uh, to the battalion level. And they're at a point in their career where they have been very successful up to this point. They've been selected for promotion a number of times. They're senior military officers. We then select uh, further about a third of every year group uh, who, is, who is highly competitive for future service at the highest levels of our military to take one year off of the line out of their units to spend a year in Carlisle at the War College doing some study, some individual research, and some reflection uh, guided by our faculty there, um, focused on the transition from that tactical level to service at the national level of strategy. So we spend a lot of time in our coursework on concepts of coercion and deterrence. What do you have a military for? and an awful lot of time on issues related to civil-military relations. What's the appropriate relationship between senior military professionals and the, civili the elected civilian policymakers in the Department of Defense, the White House, the National Security Council, and all around Washington, Washington D.C.? While they're there, they earn a master's degree in strategic studies, and as part of that uh, academic program, they each write essentially a master's thesis. They do a, 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 a more in-depth, individualized research project. So as I introduce uh, each of our speakers, I'll tell you about their individual research uh, interests right now. Um, and uh, I'll, for myself, when, when we get to the question and answer session, they're each gonna present a, a short talk on an area of interest to them that they've been doing some, some additional research into. But we're happy as we get to Q&A to talk about any issues related to national security, national uh, defense policy or any aspects of our, our bios. Uh, so if there's anything in those, uh, any of, of what we bring up that is of, of interest, we are happy to delve into it. Our program as we as we go around the country is not, we're not on a recruiting tour. Most of you look like you're not ready to join right away. <laughs> we primarily speak to college audiences at, at the graduate and undergraduate level. We, we've also engaged with a number of high school audiences and then with, with more public community events like this. We're really looking for opportunities to speak to audiences that don't frequently interact, at least currently, with the military so that we can ex ex enter into an exchange of dialogue about the issues that are most important to you and us related to our national security today. Um, for myself, uh, one of the areas that uh, has been 
of, of interest to me recently is the rise of China, and particularly China's Belt and Road Initiative, if you're interested in that, so I'm happy to, to uh, field some questions and doing some discussion on that dynamic. Um, but let me turn it over to our first speaker, Lieutenant Colonel Dave Short. So Dave is an air defense artillery officer. That means he's responsible and an expert in shooting down things that fly. <laughs> Usually they're bad guy things, but... <laughs> Um, he has spent most of his career, almost all of his career, with Patriot Missiles. If you're familiar with uh, the Patriot Missile System, he, he is truly an expert in that system. He has served uh, a lot overseas. He served in Korea, he served in Japan, uh, a number of different places in the Middle East. A couple of years ago, he was in Jordan supporting our operations up into Syria, and so he's got some, some expertise there. Um, and uh, his strategy research project while he's at the War College is about, let me remind myself again, oh, willpower. Willpower and the effects of willpower on uh, leaders' decision making. But uh, what he's going to talk to us about tonight is outer space. <laughs> for that uh, introduction, and yes, uh, they should always be the uh, enemy aircraft, or missiles are not friendly ones, right? Otherwise, you end up in uh, Fort Leavenworth, <laughs> the other side of Fort Leavenworth, right? Yeah. Disciplinary barracks. So, uh, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I, I am uh, Lieutenant Colonel Dave Short, and uh, I just wanted to say thank you for having us here. It's, uh, it's great to be here. Um, as I was preparing for this, uh, you know, I was talking to my family, um, last week, and uh, you know, I'm telling my daughter Olivia, and she's 10 years old, and she, you know, she's asked, "Where are you going? What are you doing next week?" And you know, I told her that uh, we were headed out here uh, to talk about uh, space, uh, you know, to folks. And uh, she kind of, she paused, and she got that like devilish smile, and she's like, "But Dad, you've never been to space." <laughs> and I was like, "I, I, I know, sweetie, but." Uh, you know, remember when I was in Colorado and I worked those ships and uh, I was in that space position and she goes, yeah, but I still think you should have, they should have somebody that, you know, has actually been to space. <laughs> <laughs> so my apologies, I have not been to space, and, uh, but we will talk, we will talk about space a little bit. So, but, um, so you might be wondering why is an army officer talking to you about space? Well, here's the interesting thing. Um, a lot of the profound work and the preponderance of work to control space uh, and influence it, influence it happens right here on the ground uh, by our uh, servicemen and women every day in uniform uh, that now are part of uh, the U.S. Space Forces um, and they defend and protect uh, both the homeland and our assets that are in space on a daily basis 24-7. Uh, um, so I had the honor of, of being part of that team when I served at uh, U.S. Strategic Command. Uh, in Colorado, so, but uh, I would, we can go for a moment, think about space for just a second, that place I have not been, but uh, if you could think a few hundred miles up above you, um, if two objects at a high rate of speed were on a collision course for each other, um, what would happen if the, the catastrophic effect of massive de debris created by a collision such as that? Um, what I'm talking about is not a hypothetical event, this actually was uh, a potential serious situation here above the city of Pittsburgh, excuse me, last, last week uh, on Wednesday at about 6.45 p.m. Uh, two objects, two satellites, a dead NASA telescope, and a defunct uh, Air Force satellite from the 1960s that uh, had been spent for fuel for, for decades uh, were colliding on a collision course at about 33,000 miles per hour. Uh, on the same orbital plane. Um, and had they struck, would have created a debris field of greater than about 300,000 pieces of debris. Um, so that's, uh, that, that would have been a significant event. It didn't happen, it was what's called a near miss uh, by about 59 feet. And yeah, it's real, real close. So um, what is the impact to that? Um, not that we would need to be worried about debris raining down on us, uh, here in the Pittsburgh area, 
but it would have catastrophic effects with that amount of debris, depending upon trajectories of affecting the other constellation of satellites, things that we depend on every day from telecommunications to global positioning systems and using your phone to navigate to just conducting a financial transaction because that relies on the timing, the precision the timing of satellites. So we'll talk a little bit about that, but let me uh, rewind a little bit and just cover, I'm gonna take an approach here and use, talk about the past and how we got here, uh, what the current environment of space is like, and then we'll end with a, a short bit on what the future of war fighting in space is. So we tend to think of uh, space uh, and history. We Sputnik, we all learned that was when we started the space race. But we started in space before then. And it was actually in September of 1944. Uh, and that was when uh, Nazi Germany launched the B-2 rocket, the first one that impacted in Paris, France. And then subsequently after that, the Nazis would continue to shoot 1,100 rockets um, at the city of London, killing thousands of civilians. So that was the humanity's first relationship with space as far as crossing the barrier with the man-made object that we crossed into space. Um, our relationship with space was born out of warfare and the employment of those rockets uh, and missiles. So over that last 75, you know, the last 75 years in that history, um, the pro primary focus of the, at least the American perspective had been to minimize the use of weapons in space, um, albeit those you know, ICBMs that we use as a deterrent. Um, but throughout the Cold War, we wanted free and open access uh, to space um, and minimize any use of the weaponization of space. And the US was the strongest advocate for what was called the Outer Space Treaty in 1967, where we had the Soviets, uh, an agreement with the Soviets and many other countries to sign which basically banned the use of nuclear weapons in space, the testing of them, and then the establishment of uh, a military base, for example, on a celestial body like the moon, uh, but then also banning weapons of mass destruction. So let's shift forward. That's, that was the past. What is the current environment in space like? And I just would like to real quick just talk about what space itself is like, even though I have not been there. Um, so how, how would you characterize it? And this morning we had a great talk with some high school students. Um, and you know, we had, asked them some questions and we're talking to them about it. They're like, what do you think it's like? You know, how far away is space? Because we tend to think it's this abstract, you know, nebulous thing that doesn't affect us in any way, shape, or form. And we think it's really far away. You know, a lot of them thought it was further than Tokyo, right? <laughs> or further than New York City. And it was like, what about Harrisburg? Uh, and then, uh, you know, we got to the point where it was like, what if I told you that space was as close as Punxsutawney, Pennsylvania? And they were like, oh, is that close? <laughs> yeah. Uh, whether, you know, Punxsutawney Bill sees a sh you know, shadow or not, you know, but it's, it's close. Uh, it's only, you know, roughly 60 or so miles. Uh, when you go straight up uh, in space. Height-wise, it's not a challenge to get there. That's not what all those rockets and energy is designed to do. Isn't The height's not the challenge. The speed is the challenge. Uh, and it's one of the fundamental issues with space, especially when you're talking about orbit, um, to be able to go that fast. But it's an environment that is very harsh. The conditions are difficult. Extreme temperatures from hot and cold hundreds of degrees difference depending upon uh, what you're doing and where you're at, um, as well as exposure to radiation at the subatomic particle level. So this creates some difficulties for operating in this environment. Um, and I'll, I'll get to the speed thing here in a little bit, because that really does matter, especially when we talk about when it's congested. But how does the U.S. keep an advantage in this harsh, dynamic environment that's competitive and contested and congested and about to get even more congested. Uh, conditions are back rapidly changing in this environment. Rivals and competitors are developing their own capabilities um, to challenge US dominance in space, unlike what has been seen before. Our current armed ser services, they weren't equipped to handle these new threats from rivals and competitors and some of the emerging technology. Um, they weren't just they weren't, didn't have the force structure or the capability in order to counter these type of threats. 
So remaining competitive in this environment required that new force structure. And we'll talk about that when we talk about the future of uh, war fighting in space. So uh, one uh, key piece is that the environment of space has changed when it comes to the threat. Um, like I said, mostly over the last 75 years, the U.S. dominated in that space and was uncontested for the most part. Uh, that, that has been challenged now. Uh, it's been challenged by rivals uh, and competitors of other nations that operate in this environment that look to integrate their space capabilities, uh, deny us access, um, and develop their own organic capabilities to exploit space. They observed us in the, uh, the U.S. in the first Gulf War using precision-guided munitions uh, and how the U.S. would exploit space to the advantage of our armed forces and the joint force. They took note and they adapted. So currently today, adversaries threaten U.S. operations in space with things like reversible jamming, directed energy weapons, and anti-satellite technology, what's called ASAT capabilities. That includes kinetic destruction of on-orbit satellites. These changes and capabilities present a clear uh, and unambiguous danger to U.S. assets in space and our allies. So it's an environment that's complex, changing, it's defined by constant competition, and fundamentally different than the conditions during the early days of the space race uh, or the Cold War. And some examples of that is both China and Russia to 2015 in a banner year. That year, uh, depending on whatever was going on in your life, you might have passed right by and might not have seen this, but in 2015, both the Chinese military and the Russian military reorganized their forces to form strategic space forces. Uh, they combined, in some cases, as in the Russians, military and civilian forces together, so now that the Russian government uh, completely has, uh, owns all space-specific activities uh, from the Russian state. The Chinese combine space, intelligence, electronic warfare capabilities, um, all in, in cyber, all into one unit, one formation, and deployed uh, anti-satellite technology capability for field units. So, those, those are, it's changed, and the threat has changed. So, going back to the, the environment itself, so it's congested, and I talked about that speed. Well, that speed is so fast, 33,000 miles per hour, sometimes it's hard for us to capture what that is in our head. Just to stay in orbit, what's called orbital speed, you've got to travel at about 17,000 miles per hour. What is that? What does that correlate to? Because it's kind of nice to have an example, right? Well, if we were to shoot a, if we were to shoot a bullet, right, that, that's about 1,700 miles per hour. So just to stay in orbit, it's 10 times faster than the speed of a bullet. So if you were to put, if you were to stand at the end of a football field, and you were to fire a gun, and you had the International Space Station above you, and you are gonna do a race, who's gonna make it to the other end zone quicker? By the time, if you both started at the same time, you fired that gun, by the time that bullet reached the 10 yard line, the ISS, moving in orbit would already be at the other end zone. That's how fast it is. Um, and so what that does is any little piece of any object up there becomes deadly and catastrophic if it hits something else because of the kinetic energy uh, that's created. So there's about 1,800 satellites up there, um, and that's gonna grow anywhere from 1,800 uh, to potentially 20,000 satellites in the next few years. That's with the number of competitors, rivals operating in that space, as well as uh, the commercialization of space. So that's where it gets me to the point of what, so what's the future of space? It's gonna be very congested, and it's gonna be contested uh, with our rivals. And so that's why there's the development of the Space Force and the establishment of it, because it's a, just a different environment than it's been before. And so that Space Force, um, is there as the sixth branch of the service, newly established uh, branch of the service, and for now the smallest, um, but it's there to maintain free and open access to space to make sure that the U.S. has access to that environment because rivals have challenged that. Um, and they are there to defend our assets that are there uh, and then deter enemies from taking any uh, hostile action and then at the same time, if necessary, uh, defeat threats that pose a, uh, a danger to U.S. assets uh, and our national security. So um, 
that's, uh, I appreciate you listening, and that I, I look forward to any questions you may have about space, the environment, uh, or if you have uh, questions related to that on things like technology, like hypersonic uh, vehicles, or uh, directed energy, or anything associated uh, with space. So thank you very much. Up. Uh, you may have noticed that one of us looks like they're not dressed in the right uniform. Uh, <laughs> Lieutenant Colonel Amanda Evans is in fact an Air Force officer studying with us uh, at the Army War College. She brings a, a, a several different perspectives uh, into her seminar. One is the Air Power Air Force perspective. The other is she is an Air National Guardsman. Um, so she, she's got a little bit different perspective than most of our students who are active duty. Although uh, Amanda is a full-time guardsman, so she her full-time job is with the Air National Guard. She is from Salinas, California. She's a financial management officer, so her career is as a comptroller, telling all the rest of us, no, you can't buy that, <laughs> and counting all the beans. Uh, she has commanded uh, at, at multiple levels uh, various finance and comptroller units. Her most recent assignment, uh, and she has her, her MBA, um, in financial management from Naval Post Grad. Her uh, most recent assignment prior to coming to us at the War College was serving uh, directly for the Chief of the National Guard Bureau, so the National Guard's representative on the Joint Chiefs of Staff. So she's got a significant amount of experience in the Pentagon. Her individual research project for the year is on empathetic military leadership. Some of you have been associated with the military long enough to understand notice there could be a dichotomy between those two terms. <laughs> so I will leave it to her to address that potential issue. Uh, but uh, Amanda is going to talk to us a little bit about the state partnership. Good evening. Thank you so much for your introduction, sir, and thanks for tonight for having me and all the hosts and everyone who's worked to put this together. We really appreciate it. Um, like Colonel Schein said, tonight I'm going to be talking about state partnership programs. And this is a unique way that the Department of Defense uh, promotes security by building relationships with our allies and our friendly nations. Now, how many of you know that in September of just last year, five months ago, that Governor Wolf went to Lithuania? Anyone? Yeah. One person. <laughs> so he met with over 100 Pennsylvania National Guardsmen who are actually performing training missions for the Lithuanian Armed Forces. He was able to witness firsthand these two countries working together uh, to foster interoperability and build relationships. This was just one event of over 30 events performed by the National Guard of Pennsylvania and Lithuania in 2019 alone. And this, again, is called State Partnership Program. What I want you to gain tonight from my short speech is how America uses alliances and partnerships around the globe to give the United States an unmatched advantage over our competitors. State partnerships are cost effective, they leave a small footprint, and they broaden the pool of foreign partners around the globe. I'm going to first explain the state partnership program and then cover three reasons why strengthening partnerships through building alliances is uh, basically vital to the success of our military. I'll talk about how the program supports, directly supports the national defense strategy, and then I'll talk about the importance of interoperability. And last, I'm gonna demonstrate how relationships matter. So let's get started by first answering the question, what is a state partnership program? It's a program that, can, that connects a state's national guard with a partner country's military. All 54 states and territories have a partnership, and some actually have two. Like previously mentioned, Pennsylvania is a partner with Lithuania. There are currently 78 partnerships with uh, 78 partnerships with 85 countries around the globe. And each year, the Guard works with the Department of the, uh, the Secretary of Defense as well as the combatant commands to build about two or three new partnerships. So we're 85 strong and growing. Uh, what we do is we link a state to a country with a unique capability usually of comparable size, mission, and focus. These partnerships are built on trust, cooperation, and shared goals. 
The program is not designed to make a different nation's military self-sustaining. Rather, its goal is to develop and maintain an, an important security relationship between the U.S. and these other nations to build lifelong partnerships with common goals. And now that you have a background on the state partnership program, let's cover my, first, uh, my three main points. The first, the 2018 National Defense Strategy uh, has three lines of effort. Uh, one is to build a more lethal force. Another is to make the department have greater accountability and affordability, which of course is important in my line of work as a comptroller. But third, third line of effort is to strengthen alliances and to attract new partners. So the state partnership program directly supports and executes our national defense strategy. State partnerships are, provide a durable, asymmetric, strategic advantage that no competitor or rival can match. It is a network of allies and partners that make a force multiplier that help the United States achieve peace and deter, if necessary, and then if necessary, fight an adversary. Which leads me to my second point, how partnering with other nations increases our interoperability. Given a future threat, we work together with our allies and partners to fight against an adversary. And the only way we can know how to do that together is by working together. Now, could you, could you imagine being a quarterback of a team, and being pulled from that team, being put on a new team with all different members and have never practiced together. And you're being told that tomorrow you're gonna go play the Pittsburgh Steelers. You think you're gonna win? Probably not. If you've never practiced together, the chance of your success is slim. So the state partnership programs are built to avoid a situation like this. Not necessarily in football, but in flying fighter aircraft together or performing humanitarian assistance or disaster response together. Even cyber, cyber defense and uh, communication security. All these things that we practice when we partner with other nations. Working with our partners increases our interoperability and ensures our defense enterprises can work together effectively in peace, which is in practice and exercises with the military, but most importantly, in conflict. See, increasing our strength in peacetime will only improve both nations' capabilities in times of conflict. The last reason why strengthening alliances through state partnerships is so important is because relationships matter. The program is so successful because it's largely executed, or is executed, by the National Guard. You see, guardsmen are at the same base for 5, 10, 15, even 20 years. And they provide a continuity to these bonds between country and state, and they only get stronger and stronger each year because these relationships aren't temporary in nature. I went to dinner with a fellow Lieutenant Colonel uh, Guardsman at the War College last week. And she's a part, she's basically an Idaho Guardsman who partners with Cambodia. She was so excited to hear that I was speaking on the state partnerships program. She said that she's been to Cambodia eight times with her state. And she enjoyed her experience immensely. She said what surprised her most was not what we taught them, but what Cambodia taught her and her team. She said it, she said it was an amazing, amazingly enlightening experience, and she came away with a better understanding and appreciation for what their partnership can do. You see, these partnerships aren't solely military in nature. They leverage a whole of society approach. Uh, they, brought, they basically facilitate broader interoperability with government, economic, social, and economic even educational spheres. Governors of the state, for example, meet with prime ministers of their nation's partner country, and they share ideas and approaches. As mentioned, Governor Wolf went to Lithuania, but did you know that Lithuania's president visited here in March of 2019? She, uh, Daila Garbershop, went to the Indian town Gap and was able to experience those exercises happening between the per Lithuanian troops and the Pennsylvania Guardsmen, and she was able to see those capabilities being built between both nations. Additionally, the Pennsylvania State Emergency Management Agency worked with the Lithuanian Fire and Rescue Service. They actually worked to develop different strategic plans 
and work to cooperate in disaster preparedness and defense support to civil authorities. As, na as these national relationships continue to grow, so will the economic and diplomatic opportunities, which are great for both nations. In closing, I challenge you tonight to Google the State Partnership Program. Specifically, Google Pennsylvania and Lithuania's Partnership Program and see what the great things they're doing across the state and around the world. You see, the network of allies and partners is so important. It's a force multiplier. It help, helps us achieve peace. It helps us deter if necessary. And if we ever have to fight, we will be completely interoperable and work together and succeed. Thank you for listening, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Amanda. Last, uh, let me introduce Colonel Joe Pacino. Um, Joe is a public <laughs> affairs officer, um, so he's uh, supposed to be an expert in communicating with the public. We'll see how he does. Uh, his uh, He's, uh, he's from uh, uh, Deer Park, New York. He's got a master's degree from Georgetown University. Um, I think it's safe to say that, that the real highlight of his career was uh, the two-man tent that we shared together uh, during the invasion of Iraq in 2003. He's learned a lot. Uh, <laughs> un unlikely. Um, he's, done, uh, he's done a couple other things. He, he has served uh, all over the world. He's, he's done a lot of his career. Uh, in and out of the Pentagon in Washington, D.C., and uh, quite a lot of time at Fort Bragg, North Carolina, as well. Um, he served recently as the public affairs advisor to Mr. Pat Shanahan when he was the deputy secretary of defense, and then for the, the, all of Mr. Shanahan's time as acting secretary of defense. Um, Joe is, uh, he, in his, in his most recent uh, tour in the Pentagon, he was integral in the update uh, uh, writing our current policy on transgender, transgenderism and transgender service. And uh, I still can't believe it's actually true. He performed his one person, one act play, The Only Man Who Knew, for two nights in Washington, D.C. And I don't even know what to say about that. <laughs> People loved it. Joe is going to uh, hopefully, in a, in a clear way, both explain to us why we need to do a better job securing our southwest border and also why we don't really do it. Okay. You know, I just want to answer. I don't know much about sports. You know that, right, sir? I don't know much about sports. But I just want to answer Lieutenant Colonel Amanda Evans' question here about I think if they took the people in here and formed a football team, and they played the Pittsburgh Steelers, I think you'd have a pretty good chance. <laughs> the Steelers suck right now, they're terrible. Yeah, yeah. I said it, I said it, they suck. Okay. I'll probably never be invited back to Pittsburgh. I don't care. There's a lot of places I can go to do this sort of thing. Look, let's get serious here. So, um, who thinks that we have a crisis on the southwest border, an immigration crisis? Who thinks we have a crisis? Okay, let's see. Keep, please keep your hands up so I can just get a little here. What about you with the camera? No, you don't think so. <laughs> you don't carry the All right, look, so that's what I'm going to talk to you about. Now, I, wh one of the things I'm studying is the impact of, of climate change, the impact of, of the rise of autonomous weapons and technology in the future of warfare. But right now, and so I'd be happy to answer any questions about that. But right now, I'm going to talk to you about this problem, the, the Southwest border. So right now, um, every month, more than 76,000 unauthorized migrants enter the border through, our, through the American Southwest, illegally. So that is more people than can, it's like 4,000 more than can fit in high speed. It's a lot of people every month. 2,200 every day, 92 every hour. So we probably have about 92 people here right now, that amount of people coming in every hour, unauthorized, illegally. We don't know where they're coming from, we don't know what they're bringing, we don't know what they want. So I can tell you firsthand, I've done a number of trips to the southwest border with the Secretary of Defense. I've studied this issue for um, more than a year. And I can tell you firsthand that the people that come over here are suffering souls. They have just made the most horrific, dangerous journey of their lives, in some cases with young children, 
in some cases with babies. And when they get over here, when they do arrive in the United States, they deserve the greatest compassion and dignity and humanity that the United States can offer because those are our values. But we have to know who's coming in. We do have to know who's coming in. So right now, there are about 5,500 American soldiers working on the border with Customs and Border Protection. Customs and Border Protection is the arm of the federal government that secures uh, the border, that works with the Department of Homeland Security. So right now we've got about 5,500 soldiers working there, and just like with anything related to the southwest border, this is a very hot button political issue. It's a source of great controversy, American soldiers on the border. So I'm going to do two things. I'm going to argue for keeping American troops on the border, and then I'm going to argue against that position. Okay, what do you think? What do you think, sir? Hey. Well, let me make the arguments first. Let me make okay, so who here thinks like this guy here? What's your name, sir? Joe. Joe? Oh, my name is also Joe. All right, very nice to meet you, sir. Who here, who here agrees with this Joe that we should not have American troops we should not have American soldiers on the southwest border. Okay, all right. Who here thinks that we should have American soldiers on the southwest border? Okay, and the camera, the camera person is not voting there. Okay. okay, all right. So let me make the first argument. That's good. We're going to do this poll again at the end. Let me make the first argument. The first argument is that we should have American troops on the southwest border. So here's the argument, you ready? Uh, the argument is that this is, American soldiers on the southwest border is a legitimate use of military personnel and a legitimate use of military resources because it is a legitimate crisis and it's a national security issue. So there's three reasons I say that. The first reason is we've been doing this for decades. We've had soldiers on the border for decades. So the national media narrative would lead you, lead you to believe that we first started doing this in the Trump administration, and that's not true. <coughs> President Clinton first put active duty soldiers on the border in 1996. Um, President Bush increased the number, President Obama increased the number, and now the number's increased, it really doubled under, under President Trump. So it's not a new thing. That's, that's my, first, my first point. My second point is, I just want you to think about the resource capability here, the resource gap. So we have a border that's 2,000 miles wide long in the southwest. About half of that border is obstructed by water, mountainous terrain, you can't get through. Natural obstacles. About 300 miles is obstructed by some sort of fence, wall, partial wall. So there's about 700 miles of border that are unobstructed, just free terrain, free desert for the most part. And so we have 20,000 border patrol agents that secure that 700 miles. It's a lot of area they have to cover, and it's 20,000. In addition, those 20,000 agents, they also have to process every detained immigrant through a very bureaucratic process. They have to make sure that asylum claims are processed. They've got to make sure everybody has legal representation, everybody's fed, housed, medical care, and these are people that come here in pretty terrible condition by the time they arrive. So all of those tasks, all of those tasks, take them off of where we need them to be, where we need them to be, is on the border, takes them off the border and in the border patrol stations. So American soldiers in those border patrol stations doing those administrative tasks helps us get Customs and Border Protection further out on the border, which is where they need to be. So Really, that's, that's the, the point, and I can talk in greater detail in the question and answer about specifically what our soldiers are doing in the border. So, my third point, here's my third point in the pro-American troops on the border problem. So, there is a crisis in this country, there's a humanitarian crisis in this country, and that is the opioid epidemic. In this state, this state has the fourth highest death per capita rate due to opioid overdose in the United States. 38 people for every 100,000 Pennsylvania residents. Fentanyl, a particularly deadly synthetic opioid, is coming here through the southwest border. It's made in China for the most part, but it, it traffics in here through, through Mexico. So having American soldiers on the border allows, will allow us to deter and stop and decease the flow of fentanyl that's deadly coming in here. 
So it's the, the troops plus the, the development of a border wall, which is ongoing. That's it. That's my argument for. That's my core argument. All right. Now I'm going to go the opposite. So here's my argument against. This is my argument against having American troops on the border. It's it's not it's not appropriate. It's inappropriate to have troops on the border or military resources. And there's three reasons I say that. The first reason is that we have to remember why we have a standing army in this country. Who here has an idea why we have an army? To defend the border. To defend the border? Okay, I would disagree with you on that. I would disagree with you on that. Uh, I would disagree with you that that's why we have an army. Who, who else has an idea why we, why we have an army? To protect the country. To protect the country. How do you protect the country? We protect the country. What's that? Defend the border. Okay, all right. <laughs> I'm going to win this guy over. <laughs> He's going to come around to my position. Um, him and Joe are going to team up here. They're going to be on the same side. So, you know, we have an army to kill our nation's enemies, effectively in large numbers. That's, that's, what, that's why we have a standing army. We have to protect the nation from our enemies. And if our enemies know, and our adversaries know, that we can impose costs on them, they will not, they will hesitate to take action against us. But we have to be ready to kill our enemies tonight. Anything we do should be towards that end. Anything we do should be towards that end. And the border mission detracts from that. It takes soldiers away from training for combat, and it puts them in these border processing stations. You know what I'm talking about. And it puts them in these border processing stations where they don't even carry weapons. And they don't train for combat tasks for seven, eight, nine, 10, 11 months, 15 months at a time. So that's my first reason. My second reason is, who is the guy that said, uh, we have an army to, to protect the border? That's not we have an army. We have a department to do that, the Department of Homeland Security. It's in their title, Homeland Security. Their mission, border protection. If that agency is not fully resourced, adequately resourced to defend the border, that is a problem for Congress to solve. It's not a military problem. My third point here in the anti-campaign, is that, um, look, I worry about our soldiers being politicized. This is a politically divisive, it's toxic. Anything with the border is toxic. I mean, I've been all over the country with this border stuff. Anywhere you go, you can't even really talk about it for the most part. I just worry about our soldiers being used almost as a political prop to support a campaign promise during a presidential campaign. We, ha we must keep this uniform apolitical. We must be above the fray. This uniform has survived 44 presidential administrations, and it will survive 44 more. Presidents come and go, elections come and go, Congress come and go. This maintains, the uniform maintains, the dignity of the uniform. So we have to keep our soldiers apolitical in order for that to maintain. So those are my arguments for, my arguments against. Let's do the poll again, what do you think? Okay, who is, who believes we should have American troops on the border? Okay, we want some people over up here. Okay, we want her over. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. And who believes we should not? All right. Okay, good. All right. We turned like seven people. And camera, the camera person is still on the fence. She's thinking about it. <laughs> She's thinking about it. Um, so look, here's what I want you to do. Here's what I hope you take away. I hope you take away that this is a really complicated issue. There are a very complicated set of factors that are pushing down on this issue. And it is... It is for, to boil something this complicated down to a tweet or a talking point or a slogan, it's, it's not only intellectually lazy, it is dangerous for the republic. And I thank you for the dialogue. Susan, can you imagine sharing a two-person <laughs> Ask my wife, I'm a peach to be around. Trust me. Excuse me, Colonel Sir. Between the two of you, who has data right? Good point. Okay. Good point. That's your fault. <laughs> I've been a colonel for like 72 hours. Thank you. I'd like, I'd like to thank you for asking this question. I think, I think if you want to spend some time delving deeper into that, it's, it's a topic that's worth uh, discussing. Let me, we've given you a number of different uh, different topics uh, that we could consider, and again, if there's something that we didn't talk about that we should, we are happy to take a crack at it. Uh, so let me open it up for questions, and uh, we'll just see where it takes us. Sir. Uh, I'm concerned about an 
So uh, let me, for, for all of these, uh, partly for, uh, for our uh, recording up here, I'll do my best to summarize the question uh, into the microphone so that we capture that and everybody doesn't see it. So, and, if, and for anyone, if I don't, if I misrepresent your question, please feel free to, to interrupt and correct me. So um, your question, sir, uh, is related to the, the concern of financial warfare against the United States. Uh, the threat of uh, the threat to our economy, and is the military particularly concerned about the threat to uh, about potential threats to our economy? Um, I will simply say yes, and then see uh, if you guys want to elaborate. I think you're talking about an internal effort to sabotage the economy. Combination. There are a lot of countries outside of the United States that would like to see our economy go down. Sure. Yeah. They'll do anything they can to destroy it. I see. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, I think that w when we talk about conflict today, we're talking about a persistent state of competition. And that is competition that's economic. It's online. As Dave said, it's, it's in space. It's with information, disinformation from Russia. So, you know, th we're in a constant state of competition, and the military is an arm of that competition, uh, as is the entire federal government. So, you know, I think I would just push back a little bit. I, I, I wouldn't necessarily traffic in any conspiracy theories here. I think we should be informed on some of these things and, and just thoroughly go into the issues. But um, you know, the military is part of the competition that we have, an ongoing competition with many states. Yeah, I, the only thing I would just address with that concern, at least from an internal perspective, is that um, we do have uh, the Federal Reserve Right, and Chairman Powell and the Committee on the Reserve that is founded on democratic values uh, that has the greatest influence to be able to pull levers to affect the economy um, through uh, you know, easing uh, financial uh, metrics. So I think uh, quantitative easing, you know, easing, you've heard of that. So I, I really think though that that, that position and that committee that votes in a democratic manner is apolitical, and it was designed purposely to, uh, you know, those positions outlast any, any they're longer than any presidential administration, uh, and they're designed to keep the best interest of the economy uh, and the development of U.S. jobs in its number one interest at all times. And so they vote on whether they do quantitative easing, lower or raising interest rates, and putting cash as a reserve, in, you know, taking cash out of the reserve and putting it into the system to influence it. So um, I just, from an internal perspective, um, I, I think you just have to remember that those values are based on a democratic process, that they vote on what's best, and they are not subject to uh, orders from any political party. So and I, I would uh, add to that, so, so uh, both gentlemen have referred sort of to other arms of our government, for the most part. And I would, I would say we, we're all mili professional military officers. Our, our area of expertise is in the application of military power. Um, we certainly recognize a, that a, 
the military power of the United States is founded on an extremely strong economy that has been the largest in the world for almost 100 years. We have, so we're very much aware of that. We also recognize that there are limitations to what military power can do, but there's a lot of interlinkages. Uh, we don't have a naval officer with us, but as an example, the United States Navy for decades has been the guarantor of freedom of navigation and freedom of the high seas in the global commons because since, the, since before the founding of our nation, we have been a seafaring, sea trade-based economy. We continue to be so. And so the military remains very concerned about threats to that. We also, frankly, are humble enough to recognize there are several other organs of the federal government that have a better, a, a greater expertise in the specifics of things like economic competition uh, and have better and more appropriate tools to respond to. If I could just, one, if I could just do one last question. Sure. So you mentioned the impeachment, the attacks from the left and the right, and vice versa and the election, those things are of no consequence to your army. No consequence. Your army will be ready to kill our nation's enemies tonight, irrespective of who wins the election, what happens to the impeachment, etc. Sir. Could you address cybersecurity and particularly what's the civilian input into what you got to <coughs> Yeah, so um, really where we're going with the, the 2020 budget, the fiscal year 2020 budget, has a lot of investments in, in our cyber capabilities. And then, of course, once we start talking about our cyber capabilities and our cyber defenses, it immediately gets to a level of classification that we can't talk about in public libraries. But, um, you know, <laughs> it does. It's like you work. We will lock the door. <laughs> You know, I would tell you that the when I was working at Secretary of Defense, um, the, the Secretary of Defense sought, pushed through the presidential directive that allowed for offensive cyber strikes, not just hackbacks. Hackbacks are when we're struck and we we um, react to that, which we, we always could do under under President Obama. Now, as of uh, uh, August of 2018. We can do offensive strikes, so we, it's a more aggressive way of defending our networks. And uh, I guess I would just leave it at that. I know that if you look at um, you know, Cyber Command, and this, they've been, this is, Cyber Command is you know, concerned about election security, Russian interference, et cetera, um, and they are hardening our defenses for that. We're concerned about our cyber strikes. We do have outreach with the civilian community with regard to this. When you start talking about it, it's like the legalities sort of blend into each other because is a cyber attack a crime? Or is it an act of terror? Was it, you know, so, so bottom line is really a lot of that has to, is Department of Homeland Security working with Cyber Command and the Pentagon. And I'll, if I can expand a little bit at the theoretical level, because I'm the professor of the group. Um, <laughs> if, if you think about uh, de deterrence, easy to conceive of in the, in the realm of nuclear weapons. How, how do you, when's the last time we used a nuclear weapon? Every day, I would argue. We use our nuclear, our nuclear arsenal every day to deter everybody else. How does that work? Well, you gotta have a capability. So we, in the nuclear realm, we have a capability to deliver a nu nuclear uh, warhead of lots of different sizes essentially to a pinpoint anywhere on the world. So you gotta have a capability. You gotta be credible so everybody else and your potential adversary has to know and believe that you actually can do what you say you can do. And you've gotta demonstrate a willingness to use that capability. So they not only have to believe that you could do it, they have to believe that if they push you too far, you will do it. That's how nuclear deterrence has worked since 1945. This is applying that same logic at the theoretical level in the cyber realm to say, we're not, we're of course gonna continue every time we find a vulnerability in a network, we're gonna try and correct it and respond to it, but we recognize that code has gotten so complex, the internet has gotten so interconnected, 
we can't know that we've got a cyber wall across everything in the United States. It's just not possible, at least now. So part of our deterrence against cyber warfare from other states is to demonstrate a capability and a willingness to conduct other offensive cyber operations against other states so that they know that, that we have capabilities and we, have, we are willing to do so. It's a command. It's a command and command, so it's joint. All, all services are in that command. Uh, sorry, the question was, is there, is there one particular service that's responsible for cybersecurity? And the, the answer is it, it, it's a joint command. Sir, in the back. Yes, I have a question about space, and I realize no one's been to space on the panel. <laughs> 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 but here we go. Um, so there's all, on, 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 the, on the Earth, we have all these planes flying around. There's air traffic control that controls them, so they don't run into each other. Is there anything or any organization or any system that manages all this stuff in space, and can anyone put anything they want up there? Yeah, so, so the question was about was uh, about how we manage the traffic that goes into space and, and uh, what's in orbit, like we do on, on Earth with air traffic control. So if I could be as concise and simple as possible, the answer is yes, somewhat, and yes. Um, so uh, yes, uh, there, there is notification uh, when uh, assets or satellites are put into orbit. Um, and previous to U.S. Space Force, um, it, that was just stood up, um, that mission was done by what's called AF Space, which is Air Force Space. Um, and every, just about every entity in the world would call or notify AF Space of a scheduled launch and putting an asset in orbit um, to make sure that the correct synchronization and deconfliction was done. And they were truly the, the body that, that did that, um, I, except for some few rogue actors like, uh, you know, Rocket Man and uh, North Korea, right? They just launch when he launches when uh, he's ready, right? So, but, um, so that's the notification piece, but you're getting at a, a regulation piece. So there are some uh, policies with the United Nations as far as regulations on, uh, on putting stuff in space. Uh, and there's been a call for greater regulation. But then there's the piece of, just because you notify somebody and you say, I have X payload aboard uh, this vessel, um, does that really mean that's what's on there? And how do you check that? Well, uh, that's where US Space Force now comes in with some of the sophisticated instruments to be able to check and verify um, what folks are putting, uh, what they say they are putting in orbit is what is actually in orbit uh, based upon the activity that it's doing, the path that it is on, and some super high speed sensors, uh, both on the terrestrial, you know, here on the ground, and then up in space itself. Um, but there is a, a bit of a call for greater, you know, kind of greater regulation to, you know, from the military side, you know, that somebody else pick up some of that mission since there's a, a deep commercialization of space. Um, and there have been options put out there that uh, the Department of Commerce, for example, and the US government pick up that regulation piece. But uh, we'll see if that comes to fruition. Steve, are there, if I could follow up, are there other states or non-state actors that, that either do that or, or compete? How would you characterize the US capability versus other potential actors to do that air traffic control yeah, absolutely. So it's part of the, you know, getting at the competitive piece that's, uh, it, it is now truly a competition, right? So the U.S. being the sole provider of that, uh, we start to see the Chinese government has started to invest in ground stations across the globe to also um, track objects uh, and, and play in that space, if you will. Um, so that's, uh, that's become a concern as far as competition and working with other uh, civilian space agencies to compete with the U.S. Uh, on that level. And right behind. So, as of right now, someone could take a 308 rifle and blow a hole in a cooling jacket on a transformer, and if you did that enough, you take the U.S. power grid down pretty easily, actually. Do we have anything in place to ensure the U.S. power grid doesn't cascade down because it's all linked together? 
that works on almost every utility, actually. They're all so old and not really haven't been upgraded. That they're very vulnerable to external threat attacks. Do we have anything in place for that? Yeah, so on the one hand, I will say, I think, I think we will very quickly go beyond the area of expertise of anyone here uh, to your first point about, uh, it was asking the, the questions related to the vulnerability, the physical vulnerability of our electrical grid across the United States. <coughs> Tens of thousands of transformers and substations all over the United States uh, that you said you could shoot a 30-06 through, take it down, and it's so interconnected that the risk of, um, of, of Doing, enough, doing that in enough places, enough times, to cause a major cascading failure. So the short answer is, I don't know, and I don't know if any of us do, what I, what I do know is, um, in response to that particular concern, uh, the government, the Department of Energy primarily, uh, has identified that specific vulnerability, and has, it, we, have been, we are investing money in um, what I'll call hardening those locations. So creating fences, for example, that are farther away, um, creating physical barriers um, that would, would make it hard, identifying where someone might go to shoot. So, and the other side of the interconnectedness of, of the, uh, the electrical system, I, I'm just not. Yeah, just, just one thing I would add from a National Guard perspective, if something like that did happen, they would respond and, and you would see big response from your state's National Guard to take care of you in the, in the beginning part of that emergency situation, disaster response. Sir. The question is, how much faster are hypersonic missiles than ours, and how did China get it first? And Dave is the perfect, perfect person to answer that. Yeah, so uh, there, there's a lot of hype about hypersonics. Right, so uh, <laughs> uh, he was practicing that in the car. I've been working on it all night. Um, so the the problem, you know, with hypersonics, the challenge isn't uh, isn't going fast, right? We've been able to go hypersonic for for a long time. Uh, the real issue is maneuverability, and it's maneuverability of a vehicle to impact uh, precisely at the point where you want it to. Um, things get from an, uh, from space and an atmospheric piece. Uh, there's a lot of different stresses and pressures that make it very difficult to put a hypersonic precisely on a target. Um, uh, I will get to the China part real quick, but there's a, there's a lot of hype with, you know, um, a lot of information out there put out about uh, threats from Russia and hypersonics, and there's questions about the credibility and the validity of that. Um, and then the Chinese, yeah, were developing for a, a long time uh, hypersonics. The U.S., did not invest in an offensive hypersonic capability as not to initiate uh, a one-for-one -one arms race in that area uh, for a very long time. But uh, once you start seeing the competing in, in different areas, uh, it becomes, you you know, you either play the game or you don't, right? So you, you, you've got to compete. And so now there's been investment in hypersonics. It is not that the, the U.S. from a science and technology and research and development standpoint has had years in, in, in the field of hypersonics uh, with some of our national laboratories and the development of off offensive systems. Uh, but the decision to go ahead and now uh, uh, go with uh, capability development to fielding and production um, is now full, full ahead uh, based upon the threat. And then also in parallel to that, the defense against them. So the Missile from a missile defense standpoint, a hypersonic can defeat existing missile defense systems because they are designed to shoot down ballistic trajectories, uh, not those that are maneuvering at high rates of speed. Um, and so, um, in parallel with the offensive piece and some of the early research that was done, uh, the, uh, the Missile Defense Agency um, is developing the capability for to move forward with hypersonic defense. And, and correct me if I'm wrong, Dave. I, I think it's, I, I don't believe China has deployed a system. Russia claims to have two working hypersonic missiles that they have out in the field. So correct, yeah. So there was somebody up top, sir. Uh, yes. Uh, Rear Admiral Colin Green, head of the uh, SEAL Brigade, just resigned this week. Secretary of the Navy resigned. And so there will be a difference of opinion with civilian leaders. I always make <coughs> criticize if you wear the uniform. Once you hang the uniform up, become a civilian again. Uh, 
you're able to do that. Uh, former uh, Secretary of Defense James Mattis has written three books, Call Sign Chaos, Holding the Line, I can't remember the other one. I haven't read that one. Uh, one day all of you will hang up your uniform. Do you feel that uh, current laws are adequate, that you could write a book, as some of these are, about a criticism or about any, any administration or whatever? Are, is the current law adequate that you can tell us, the public, who aren't in the military and don't get, you know, don't know this stuff? Is it adequate to be able to communicate to the civilian population what's going on between the upper level of our uh, administration and the military? So, uh, first of all, I'll say thank you for your question. The question was, first off, we've been in Pittsburgh all week, yeah. uh, and we we are pretty voracious consumers of news, but I hadn't seen that about Admiral Green, so I think you bring that to my attention. In the last three days. I, I was not aware of it. Um, the, the question was related to retired military officers, uh, particularly flag level general, generals and admirals, um, and whether the current U.S. law protects retired military officers from being able to, as re once they are retired, being able to speak out publicly and communicate with the public about things that they may have, may have concerns about from their experiences while serving in uniform. That's correct. Yeah. yeah, so thank you very much for that question. First of all, that's a tough issue with, with uh, Chief Gallagher. Um, so I was in SecDef when that issue was first proposed. When it was first proposed, that this was potentially going to happen on Memorial Day. It's a tough issue. It's a tough for the, the, the uniform leadership to stay above the fray on that. But one thing I would say is that, I, so I didn't actually work for Secretary Mattis. I worked for the Deputy Secretary. But I was at his sort of closing remarks to his internal staff for Secretary Mattis. And he said, look, once you retire the uniform, you should also retire the tub. And he made reference to some other generals that, and admirals who had not. His view was, you're still beholden to the administration. You're still beholden to, to the country. That's one way of looking at it. Admiral, admiral McRaven, you know, Admiral McRaven, he looks at it differently. He feels an obligation to publicly speak out again about things he's concerned about with regard to this administration. So those are two separate things. He's written a New York Times op-ed, McRaven. Those are basically two different ways of, of, of looking at it. You know, which one is appropriate? You know, uh, you know, I don't know. I, you know, which one is more appropriate? I think the Mattis Mile to me is a little bit more appropriate. That you have access to all this information. You're inside this, the 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 White House. You're inside the circle, and you have that information for the good of the country. It may not be appropriate to do some sort of tell-all thing. And, and criticize those decisions once once you've taken uniform. But you know that that's a that's a debate. I know this issue of what you're talking about about you know, Chief Gallagher and um, these exonerations. It's a tough issue, and it's tough right now for our leaders to stay above the political fray. But um, you know they have to do it. And so and so it, it is precisely thing is it is a legal order. One thing that um, you know. Good order and discipline, you've got it, they, our leaders always talk about, we've got to still good order and discipline. Sometimes good order and discipline is adhering to the legal orders from the president, even if you don't think they're necessarily a good idea. But, but to your specific question about legal protections for retired service members, uh, the, I mean, my short answer is yes, the legal protections are adequate as long as you're not disclosing classified Classified information, obviously, uh, that would be illegal and you could be prosecuted for it. What, it, what is, I think, a more of a challenge for us is about the norms of our profession. And so Joe talked about the uniform being apolitical, a nonpartisan, uh, and the military's responsibility to be nonpartisan. When I served, or I served as, as a, the two different chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, um, one of them, uh, when someone in a, in a uh, I'm not reviewing something private, but we weren't in a public forum, somebody asked him, what's the hardest thing, the most frustrating thing about your job? He said, it's retired generals and admirals <laughs> <laughs> who come out on the news and want to talk about everything that we're doing wrong. 
they, they, they get, a, get to speak because their name is General Retired. But one, they don't have the information that I have because they're not on active duty anymore. And more importantly, they don't have the responsibilities that I have because I'm still wearing these. They don't have the responsibility for living with the decisions that I make or the advice that I provide to the president. And then at that top level of those who are speaking, providing advice to the president and the secretary of defense, um, they, I'm very sensitive to your concern of what does the public need to, to know? And that's Admiral McRaven's concern is I'm still a loyal servant of the country. On the other hand, um, I think as, in terms of a professional norm, the concern is do we want presidents or civilian political leaders to have the best possible professional military advice and seek it and believe that they are, when the doors are closed, getting candid professional advice, the best advice that I have, and getting being able to have a good constructive dialogue back and forth about what we should do or not do. Are they able to do that, or do we get to a point where they, they're they first worried about, wait a minute, are you a Republican general or a Democrat general? And if we have a, if we have a real honest back and forth dialogue, are you gonna write a book about, are you gonna resign and write a book about it next week? If we get to that point where that's the first thing in the, in the decision maker's mind, then there just won't be any uniforms in the room when the decisions are made. They'll just be made by non-professionals without the benefit of professional military input. So I think, for me at least, that's the greater concern, um, at least right now. But I haven't been in that, I'm also not a, an Admiral McCraven or, or even an Admiral McCraven to be in that position. They're hard personal decisions, but we're, we do have a concern about the norms of the profession. Sir? So it's great to hear Colonel Evans talk about international partnerships, I'm absolutely passionate about myself from the outside. But of course, for 70 years plus, we've had a great alliance in NATO with the the West. My question is, what do you think about the long-term availability of use of NATO, in particular given the fragility of the Baltic states, now part of it, and also Turkey, and what they've been doing recently with the F-35, S-400, and now coasting up to Putin. How do you see it? Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you for reminding me. So, the question was about uh, about the primarily about the viability of NATO specifically as a defensive alliance. So NATO formed under United States leadership at the end of World War II in response to the threat of the Soviet Union and the communist bloc in Europe. Um, the, the sort of cliche is designed to keep the, the Russians out, the Americans in, and the Germans down. Europe, um, and pretty effective at at least two out of three. Um, the uh, the question is, uh, are we concerned about the, the viability of NATO as a credible, back to my comment about deterrence, a credible deterrent force, particularly, I think, against the, the Russian, uh, well, Turkey, well, you mentioned Turkey as well. So, member of NATO. Yeah, so but Turkey as a NATO member, and yet um, operating in direct contradiction frankly, facing opposite sides of the border in Syria uh, to United States soldiers operating in concert with the Russians, um, buying a, a Russian, a, a advanced Russian air defense uh, system, and, and the concerns for us about the transfer of technology of, of our aircraft to their air defense system and some of the potential vulnerabilities. And then the vulnerabilities in the Baltic states, Latvia, uh, Estonia, and Lithuania, all of whom are NATO members. Okay, so from a NATO perspective, I think it's still an important alliance. I think that the president, when he talks about the 2% that he expects people to pay, I think that countries are trying to get there. Um, in China, there, there are countries that are they're trying to get there. And they, I almost feel not ready to answer this question, but yeah, I'm gonna let you. I just want to just want to talk about a little bit more about about NATO, sort of writ large rather than specifically about Turkey. But you know, one of the things that that I, 
Okay, so now I'm giving you my personal opinion, right? Even though she's filming me. Giving me. So now I'm giving you my personal opinion. One of the things that I think of that I agree with this administration on is that it's important to question the value that NATO provides to the United States and our interests. It's important to value, and first of all, it's important to question our international institutions. And it's important to question NATO and the value we're getting out of that and, and the value it provides to our interests. So, you know, the issue with, with Turkey is particularly concerning. There's a lot of our uh, alliances with NATO, there's a lot of our partners with NATO that we should question. And I think, you know, our, our institutions are being questioned and our, our notions of capitalism and democracy are being questioned everywhere in the world. NATO is being questioned. I think, I think the next 20 years are going to be a, an inflection point for, for NATO. You know, perhaps there's some other construct that will provide greater value, or perhaps NATO is something that is, is beyond its, its utility that Colonel Schein talked about. It's post-World War II world order may be in some ways either slowly collapsing or moving to something else. Uh, was extremely important to their security um, and their their own interests that did not align with obviously the alliance. And so, um, but it, it does um, it does complicate things greatly. Um, but when you kind of change the perspective of where they're at, at least you can see um, where they're coming from, at least on some of the issues. If I can address a little bit the, the Baltic challenge, um, the. One of the things we, we talk with our students about is some of the international relations theory and sort of how does the world work. Um, so post-World War II, the United States led the West in establishing the UN system, in establishing the Bretton Woods economic system to govern how world trade uh, or world economic interactions would go, and the GATT WTO trade system. And uh, we have led the richest and most powerful countries of the world, <coughs> even when the communist bloc was still a thing. The US still had all the richest and most powerful allies. We've led that under a rules-based international order where we're a country of lawyers, we like laws and rules that are written out. So if we agree on a framework, the United States typically sets the rules because we're typically the ones putting most of the bill. And so we go, okay, we're gonna do that, we're gonna have a veto power too, which we maintain at the World Bank and we maintain in the, in the, uh, the UN, of course, the Security Council and, and many of these institutions. Um, that's, we believe, been generally good for the world. We're, we're pretty sure it's been good for us. We think for most of our partners and even some really significant competitors that it's been good for them. Right? An example that comes to, to the forefront of my mind is the country of Vietnam. We fought a war with them, but they're actually doing pretty well under the rules-based international order that the United States, and, and I referred earlier to the way our, the United States Navy has enforced uh, the, the uh, actually enforced the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea that we um, but other countries that are powers, at least in their own regions, don't necessarily like that system the way it is. Russia is one of those, I think, clearly. So the Soviet Union collapses the United States by, in, in my view, tries to bring Russia into that international order, but as a pretty junior partner. They didn't have a very strong economy. Their country was splitting apart uh, politically. Um, but I, I think, for the most part, the United States genuinely believed that bringing Russia into all those systems where it would abide by the rules would be good. There were some even talked about, hey, maybe we could bring Russia into NATO. Something. I don't think a lot of people think. <laughs> but that's the period of time where NATO expands its borders out into Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia, starts talking very seriously with the country of Georgia and Ukraine. Um, I think my, my sense is Russia would like to overturn that rules-based order and, and go to one that's more, <coughs> more where more the, the whoever 
whoever's the biggest country in the region gets to set the rules and everybody else kind of respects it because with all their neighbors, Russia's the biggest country in the region. If they can, can convince NATO allies that the United States won't really be there. And I think when they do things like what they did in Crimea uh, and in the Donbass region of Ukraine, Part of what, I mean, I think there's, you know, there's local reasons why they want to do that, but I think at a broader level, they're trying to challenge the credibility of the United States' commitment to NATO, um, and where that's going to go, I'm not sure, but I, I do think it's, it's, a, it's a reasonable way to look at how credible it is NATO. But it gets back to Colonel Bacino's question and, and some of our national dialogue about should it be a still a threat? It is, is there a threat to the United States from Russia that, for example, some conglomeration of EU states could take care of themselves. We actually need to kind of wrap it up now. Okay, sorry, I've been talking about too long. Okay, one more question, sir. Joe, because you get the same answer. Uh, you said that there's competition between China, Russia, and the United States in this kind of space. Now, does Russia have the economic authority to sustain the competition. That's my question. Do they, because we, right now, we're, we're the leader economically over China, over everybody. Russia is, is struggling with economic competition. Yeah, the question is, is in space in particular, uh, Dave said that, that there's a competition in space primarily right now between China, Russia, and the United States. Specific to Russia, does Russia have the economy to sustain that competition? against the United States or against China? Thank you, I'm glad you asked that question, right? So, um, so when, it comes to, um, when, it, when it comes to the economic piece, um, you leverage what you're good at, right? So Russia made a deliberate decision uh, to combine military and civilian control of space um, in 2015, and the US at one point made a decision when we retired the space shuttle and hearts broke, right? Because everybody loved this, you know, the space program and how, how could we do this? Well, there was a deliberate decision to leverage what you're good at. Go to the privatization section, sector and leverage the commercial sector to be more competitive in space than our rivals. That is one of the main reasons why. Now we've got five major private, ent private companies that are focused on space in the next year, we'll have uh, a rocket, you know, spaceship to be able to deliver folks to the International Space Station uh, via a private company. Um, because that's what we're good at from an economic standpoint. Whereas the Russian model, let's go back to the make everything state controlled in a state uh, entity, uh, is considered, at least at most in the community, to be even though they did that and shipped in 2015 to be a vulnerability. I do want to, I want to touch on China uh, just because I wanted to and I didn't get to. <laughs> um, at the, we've talked about the, the NATO and the challenge from Russia. At the, mo and, and you're absolutely right, so the United States still is the largest economy in the world despite China's rapid growth. At their absolute height, the combined GDP of Nazi Germany and Imperial Japan came, by the most conservative estimate, up to about 40% of the GDP of the United States. The GDP of China today is 70% the size of the GDP of the United States. I don't think since the United States emerged as a world power, we've had an economic competitor anywhere close to where China is today. Again, it doesn't mean that they're at parity we haven't faced this level of, of economic competition yet. Thank you very much for your wonderful question.